Welcome everyone once again to our regular weekly show live on U2 Spain. I'm Scats and today I'll be asking my expert guest, residency specialist Chris from Upsticks.es all about how much money you need to get your Spanish non-lucrative visa and how much of it can be savings or passive income, especially if it's a combination of the two. We'll clear that one up and of course what exactly is passive income. We'll also have the latest news about the strike at the Spanish embassies in the UK and something about the ferry strike as well. We'll be answering all of your questions and comments from social media, from the live chat, from the comments below about today's topic and anything else to do with moving to Spain in general. And if you're watching the recording of the show, you can find the time codes for each of the answers you need in the video description below. So, welcome to You 2 Spain. Cue the music and yeah, let's dance. So very quickly before I introduce Chris, you can now support this channel with a Patreon donation or by buying me a coffee via the links in the video description below. And U2Spain.com is where our brand new website will be launched in this coming week. It's very exciting. It's packed with loads of information and articles and all of the links you need to help you move to Spain. And the address for that is below too. Very easy to remember. U2Spain.com along with some very helpful links to where you can get discounts on loads of things that that you need for your Spanish dream. The latest one is the best currency exchange rates. I'll tell you all about that in a minute. Once again, we will be having some prizes to give away for the best questions and comments from you. So without further ado, let's meet my guest for the day. It's Chris from Upsticks.es. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Hello there. Yay. How's it? How are you doing down there? Yes, yes, we're all good. All good here in uh, down there, down there, like <laughs> down here in Malaga. Yeah. Here, um, yeah, I was just phoning about the light situation. We're gonna, we will improve that with a pop up banner soon. So I do apologise. I still it's have right. this sort of hate around my head. It's all right. You've got a, you've got a very handsome silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're um, that's because I'm sat down. If I had my belly silhouette. Here, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah no, we, we're, we're good here. We had. Um, I don't think we didn't have it. The uh, Kalima is, is as bad as what you had it um, up there. We uh, sort of had it for a day, but didn't really see the, the photos I saw on the internet weren't the same here, really. Yeah, we were actually right up in the in the middle of the cloud of red dust. It was it was like an apocalypse. It looked very strange. The the light situation was very odd, and I thought that that's why I had this this cough and problems with uh, uh, you know just felt like a, a bad cold and I thought yeah. oh, this isn't very good and I, I was due to do some gigs for for St Patrick's Day on Thursday just some free stuff with some session musicians and I said lads I'm gonna have to have a microphone can't sing properly and one of them said you'd better test for Covid and I did it and I was positive so yeah. I couldn't sing which was a right pain I was looking forward to that Wow. There you go. So it wasn't did the you, cloud after all. Did you report on the app? Did you report on the app? How's it work with the app? I've never, I've never tested positive, so I, no, I don't know. I've still only got the Irish app, and I've, oh, I've, right. I've not uploaded. That was a bit silly of me, but um, no, I reported it on the local uh, computer social group and said everybody who went to the, the craft fair last weekend uh, where I bought these lovely fingerless gloves, um, uh, unfortunately that was the super spreader event by the sound of it because there were there were at least two other people who tested positive after that. All so, right. So, and I stupidly didn't wear a mask because there were a few people not wearing masks there and I thought, oh, it's all right. It's time to take them off now. Of course it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's still strange. I can't believe I've never had it. I can't. We, we were just um, we were speaking mm. this morning with my wife Lara. Who was, it was on the show once. She she said because she works in a school and it's just been you know riddled. <laughs> and I'm always out with 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 clients or whatever, and the people we see, the kids are at school. We've had about you know all their classes a, a couple of a few closures, and and uh, yeah, we've never we've never had it. Um, and I think they're now taking a slightly lighter stance on it because I did. I had a cold a couple of weeks ago and had two uh, negative 
um, of what they call an electoral flow test. Mm -hmm. And I actually filled in the app and said, look, I still got symptoms. What do I do? They called me the next day. And uh, she said, uh, I said, I think I need to have a PCR because sort of it's your social responsibility if you're going to be meeting with people to do it, even though I've got two negative uh, lateral flow tests. She went, oh, no, don't bother. We trust them now. So just crack on. Mm. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah. I did. I was fine in a week. So I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think it's, uh, yeah. Mm hmm. Fortunately, the the Facebook group is is uh, more efficient than than uh, than an app, I think, because everybody knows uh, your business. Because uh, Liz went Liz went into the post office. She tested negative in immediately before she went to the post office to pick up a parcel for me. And as soon as she said uh, her name at the desk, somebody in the queue went, "You shouldn't be here. You should you'll be spreading COVID." And and. Uh, there you go. So, of course, she was perfectly fine and, and legal. So we had to spread that on the. I had to put her negative test up on the on the social group to say, she's not spreading. We're perfectly fine. We're being safe. So yeah. So let me just uh, go to the chat and see. We've got some uh, people saying hello. J M. Hello, Steve Knowles and Alan Lackenby. Good morning. Good morning, Donna, and uh, Anthony and Kerry as well. Thank you for coming on the chat this morning. We, uh, there's a question which I'll put up on the screen now in case it disappears from the chat. We'll cover this one later. Can we talk about applications for dependents? Yeah. Shall I apply in my own right? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Advantages and disadvantages. Yes, we'll answer that one uh, a little bit later on. Thanks for that. So um, just uh, remind the brand new viewers, Chris, what you do at Upsticks before we begin. Yeah, so now sticks here. We help people. We're we're a key part of people's big dreams, and uh, we help people with non-lucrative visas, with EU residencies, EU uh, family members, and basically we do all the immigration paperwork um, for you. And uh, we also register cars here as well, mm -hmm. or not, because that comes hand in hand a lot of the time with doing immigration paperwork. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. Uh, What's happening about this strike then? Let's have our news update. The the strike by the uh, embassy staff. How many strikes do we want? We've got a, a, the transport strike as well, haven't we? I can tell you yeah. story about that this week as well. Okay, so with the strike, um, basically, um, we've so we had an appointment. Let's start first of all with Edinburgh. We had an appointment go through in Edinburgh this week, and um, the, um, that was fine. It went through absolutely, absolutely, absolutely fine. Um, Angel, who attended our clients, said, look, they are on strike and they have this thing called minimum services, but to carry on as normal. So basically what normally happens in a strike here, and um, I've seen quite a few myself here at the at the airport and, and around, is they have a, like a government, obviously a, a um, a, the, the head there. What do they call those? The, uh, where you, the what's the governing body where you when you work and you go to complain and they and they put your complaint towards the union. Oh, union. Oh yeah. <laughs> union. So that a union or some sort of representative, and obviously you have to take strike action. And, and at the moment, the consulates are striking because of the the wages, and they haven't had a wage wipe so, um, since two thousand and eight. And obviously, you have to make note of that action. So they've had a, a, a strike action on, on Monday. I believe they're picked in at the uh, London consulate. And then obviously, that strike stays in force. And obviously, the unions, whoever represents them, or I don't know who it is, will speak to whoever they need to speak to and start negotiating the uh, uh, the wages and whatever they need to negotiate so the strike action stops. During this period, they go on what a thing called servicios minimos which usually means that the job's still getting done, but there is a progressive strike action um, um, going on. You know, the mm -hmm. threat of more strikes, the threat of maybe every Monday being a strike, I don't know. But So, yeah, so far, so good. Uh, we had a good appointment in Edinburgh. Uh, that's fine. Uh, Manchester, <clears throat> we put a few applications in for appointments, uh, which they normally take around three days to respond uh, via email and give us a date, which they hadn't done. But we had, we did try and contact them and say, look, what do you expect us to do? So we just need to plan moving forward. So please tell us, do we carry on the same way we were working before? Um, or or do, do you want us to stop? We've got people, obviously, who, who are pending starting time-sensitive documents. Um, do we start those now? Because we have a sort of a six week before structure to give us a bit of leeway at the end. Um, and they said, no, just carry on sending emails have you, as you have done before. Um, and we've got an appointment going through 
uh, next week uh, in Manchester. Um, so Shamil, who probably is watching the channel today, actually watches us. Uh, so we'll hit, I'm, ask, I'm going to ask for a report back from him. And then London, we are going to be asking for appointments in London on Monday, Tuesday. So I haven't got any sort of news from London yet to see how that's going through because we haven't had any appointments go through. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as we make those requests, we'll give you an update. Okay. So it's it's not affecting people who've got an appointment. They can still no, no not at the moment. It. No, so far so good. And speaking to Manchester, they're like just crack on as normal. But we are in strike as such with minimum services. But they, you know they are continuing to to, to function. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So let's get the thing up about travel, transport, P and O ferries. Uh, this was a, a news item not too long ago. Amid disruptions to its services, P&O Ferries tweeted this morning, advising travellers to, to make alternative arrangements and that regular updates will be provided. That's the Dover to Calais route. So have you got any news about that? Um, no, it was more uh, the what we've had got going on here with the um, you know with the lorry drivers or striking and picketing here in, uh, in Malaga. Um, mm -hmm. That's, I don't know too much about the ferries, to be honest, but I know here, um, I, I initially, so we've got the, the lorry drivers here, you know, the, the transport companies are on strike, um, which is now causing delays with things like couriers and stuff like that. It's evidently going to have a, a knockback on food delivery and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and here locally in Malaga, um, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of tension at the moment. So the first experience I had with that was on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, I had to, I had some NIE appointments in um, in Malaga. Um, so generally we do the NIE appointments where I've got power of attorney all together in a stack in the afternoon, because if you go in the morning, they're very busy. If you can get them in the afternoon, they're slightly more relaxed and you just go in and, and do them. And the first thing was evidently, I had, I, and uh, Victoria works for me will tell you that generally I'll have an appointment in 15 minutes in Malaga and, and I'll still be sat in the office if it's a power attorney one because it takes seven minutes to get there. So, you know, I, I, so I sat here and went, oh, I've got half an hour, I'll go brilliant, probably grab a coffee if uh, if uh, I've got a bit of overtime. And uh, I got there, of course, they, they, they had they were, the procession of lorries just hooting their horns <clears throat> way into Malaga, obviously protesting at fuel prices. Um, so um, that was a bit crazy. Um, there's a few rat runs which you can actually avoid the main road. So I got I got into that. There's a lot of police. There's a lot of tension uh, there. People throwing a couple of cans about. And then also when we got into Malaga, the uh, the national police are doing a really good job of registering uh, the war refugees coming from Ukraine. So um, I have to say they were doing an amazing job uh, there. The Red Cross was there. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's the first experience I've seen of that. Um, so, but it was a bit of a crazy time to be honest in Malaga on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, lots going on. Is is uh, Prime Minister Sanchez going to reduce fuel prices? I heard a rumour about that. I don't know. I haven't seen the news about that yet. I, I hope so. I hope so. It cost cost me hundred quid to fill up a Clio yesterday, so let's hope it does. Mm. Yeah, it's mad. I mean, that's happening everywhere. So, there yeah. we go. So let's get on to the topic of the day then, money and the non-lucrative visa. It's something we've covered a fair bit in the past, but I thought it was time for a, a proper update and to cover it, you know, let's uh, hit the nail on the head with all of the details. And uh, let's see, we'll start with the financial, yeah, your financial requirements. That's without doubt an important part of the visa application. And of course, you have to be thinking ahead to the visa renewals for years two and three and four and five of your residency. We have a question about that later. So is there some kind of simple formula that people can follow, Chris? Yeah, so we're, should we talk about EPREM first? I think you had something to show on the screen there as well. well yeah, absolutely. It's gone up to, and I know, I think we mentioned it once before, but let's just show people what is EPREM. So there it is. There we go. So we can see there, that's that's the new updated EPREM. So you will need... Uh, so EPREM, let's call EPREM, is sort of a it's, a, it's a calculation that the government used to set various payments here in Spain. Um, evidently, there is a misconception that EPREM, it, so EPREM goes, has been going up, uh, you know, politically. Uh, I think Sanchez, you know, he's he puts it up to, to help cover the minimum payments for the various benefits that depend on this. Um, but evidently, when the when the the, the economy isn't in a good way, and EPREM 
goes up, it affects the visa applications in terms of how much you actually need. So for a non-lucrative visa, as you can see there, it's let's call it twenty-eight thousand. Look, you know, it's twenty-seven thousand seven hundred ninety-two for a single applicant. And then if you're going with beneficiaries, i.e., you know, a, a spouse, um, and we'll talk about when you call somebody a beneficiary or a joint application, it doesn't mean they actually have to be dependent on the person they're applying with. But if it's a couple, then you would have to add the seven grand at the bottom, which would virtually make a couple of 35, 35K for the first year. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah. So those are the figures at the bottom for annually and the figures at the top are per month, yeah. which would be confusing. We'll talk about the the uh, the difference between passive income uh, yeah. and and savings a little bit later on because it's that depends on whether you've got to look at it as an annual figure or a monthly figure that's correct yeah or both yeah, yeah. so that is eprem so that goes up year by do you, i presume you have to take into account that the fact that it goes up year by year when you're looking at your big plan your long plan because yeah you need to be looking at the the double figure that for years two and three and four and five that's right, yeah, and you can't really predict what they're going to put it up at. You know, if you look at the, they didn't go up for many years, and now it's gone up. I think it's two years in a row. So, um, yeah, you've got to take, you've got to have a buffer there just to see if it. I mean, it's it's very rare that it's going to go up more than a thousand euros a year. Mm. You know, over the, you know, if if in terms of if you're looking at the the four times, I mean, I think this year it went up uh, sixty euros or something a month. But I, I don't think there's going to be a massive hike in it because it means the government will be paying a lot more out you know, in other benefits. But um, it's certainly something to consider that, you know, if you are very, very close to EPREM, you know, how you how you would cover it if it's going to go go higher. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Just before we get on to the difference between passive and uh, the other kind, Steve's asking, can the additional applicant be your 25 year old son? Uh, so that's, it's a very, it's a tough one. I had a case this week as well. Now, um, because they are over 21 years old, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to prove that somebody, you would have to prove that they're not working, that they're solely dependent on you. It's not a no, but it's very, 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 very difficult to, to, to prove that. So basically, mm -hmm. when they're looking at, when they're looking, it is a non lucrative visa, a non-working visa. Yeah. So they, they're going to look, the immigration are going to look at the fact that that person isn't going to be working and how can you financially uh, prove that that person isn't going to be working. So first of all, you have to prove that person isn't working right now. Okay, I've actually got, a, I'll show you a bit later on, but I've got a, a letter here which I've scrubbed out for GDPR which shows them which what they give uh, if when they're asking you for further proof of not working. Um, but essentially, yes, you know, if you've got enough money to cover that applicant, then yeah, they can come, they could, they could come with you uh, if you can solely prove that they are a, a beneficiary on you. But it really is down to the interpretation of immigration. I mean, somebody's 25, they may turn around and say, do you know what, actually, we want to see that he can support himself with a 400%. So up to the age of 21, Yes, you can consider it because it is a benefit, a beneficiary. Over 21, it, it's very, very tough, to be honest. You know, it's very, very tough. You know, mm -hmm. it has to solely prove they've got nowhere to live, that, you know, they 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 are with you 100% have been 100% with you. Maybe they're studying. We, they're, in that case, you know, they might need to go for a different type of visa. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's tough for applicants over 21 to come under their parents. Yes. Okay, there's this one we're going to answer in a different way. Thanks for this question, Alan. Um, it's asking what it costs basically to, to, to get the non lucrative visa. So I would suggest you you ask Chris via his website, upsticks.es. Get in touch with him on that because um, it, it varies for, for different people. There we go. And Steve Null says, still can't get my head around the amounts you need in the bank progressing every year and that is what we're going to be talking about very shortly. Let, I'll tell you what, let's start with, because there are two different kinds, that we'll start with passive income. So if somebody just has passive income, uh, okay. tell, tell us what passive income is and uh, give us an example of what people need then. Yeah, so if you've got passive income, i.e. a pension, 
there's, there's two things I wanted to talk about passive income is, first of all, people trying to create a structure to create passive income and how that doesn't work and how we the experience that we've had with that and the first thing is obviously pensions so pensions um and i should actually had our list of passive income up but as usual i don't mm -hmm. um so if you've got say pensions or even rental income which is classed as a passive income which last year when i was at the london consulate they said yeah that's fine you can use um a, a rent, rental income as passive income as long as you've got sufficient proof mm -hmm. um then, then you can present that in various different forms. What we always advise with pensions is that you, um, if you're obviously taking a pension, you're receiving a monthly pension, but that's obviously state or uh, private, that you have a P60 or from the state pension, which you can add to, it's obviously a state pension on its own, isn't gonna, isn't gonna make enough money for, for the EPREM, but um, you might have a private and state pension. So the state always provides you with a letter which proves what you're going to get um, normally around April time on a yearly basis. And it actually says weekly on there. Um, and if you've got private pensions, then a P60, which proves what your annual income is. Now, if that P60 is is old, so for example, people are going to be getting P60s now because we're coming up to April, um, but people at the moment are still working with P60s from last year, then um, proof of where that pension's paid into the account is also a good idea to bring with you because from there they're going to be focusing on the minimum monthly requirement. So um, I could, I've got a, a, a case set example of this, and this I think was a question you had about net and gross. But mm -hmm. we had um, we had a guy whose um, pension uh, met the minimum requirement. Um, it's actually gross. We always advise net if you can advise net, but his was actually gross. Um, and uh, but it didn't meet the minimum requirements uh, pounds to euros. So they they they, they just they, they, there was a confusion at the consulate that obviously he had he was earning in sterling with the exchange rate. He met the minimum requirement, but it didn't match up when you were looking at twenty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety two. You know in pounds so uh, when he initially got to his appointment um they knocked him back but he called me from the appointment this was in manchester they said you haven't got enough money so i jumped online quickly and we did an escrito and basically i did an escrito and jumped on did a conversion explained exactly what he was earning explained that today's conversion rate this means x in euros um and we presented that and uh and then they looked at it and went all right okay yeah we understand now and it was accepted so but they, they accepted that because also he had proof of the monthly payments along with the p6 to explain him what he got mm -hmm. okay i was just going to ask just to confirm can you have rental income from uh your uk property or is it just a spanish property no, you can from a UK property. Now, this is something they confirmed in, and we've had, and we've had uh, um, NLVs approved mm. on that. But the, the, the also thing, the thing is, uh, you, what you have, what they do look at it, is the longevity of the income. So the stuff that we've had approved with the income, it wasn't solely income. It was it was, it was pensions of other passive income supported it, and there was rental income. But evidently, the rental income was well proved. So there was an agency. Uh, managing the rental we had to get that documentation translated there was proof of the rental going into an account for more than a year which then you can see there's longevity of the payments uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know every various different um uh, uh, formats of people renting and you know but if you're it would be quite tough if you were gonna just start to rent a property and use that as part of your income moving forward because you haven't got any proof that you've been receiving that income if you have been receiving rental income then it's then it would be considered uh, as passive income as long as you can prove that mm -hmm. and i wanted to mention also about another passive income is um dividends from investments or something like that that's another kind or even from if you had a business and you've passed it on to somebody else but you're still getting some kind of uh, dividend from that. But those are yeah. both passive, aren't they? 
So um, this is a great one because this this brings <coughs> us to actually what we should have mentioned at the beginning. It's obviously all income requirements um, because if you imagine that obviously the people who are going to be dealing with the application are here in Spain, so they relate everything to paperwork that they understand here. Um, so um, the every single income requirement is uh, is an interpretation of the person who revises the file on immigration okay so and also the non-lucrative visa you're not allowed to be working with they're very very clear now i know there was a lot at the beginning of the process a lot of people saying well you can maybe you could work somewhere else but this my bed and only not work in spain but they've been very clear uk consulates it's a non-working visa you can't work anywhere um now in terms of dividends evidently if you were a company owner for many years again you can prove that and you have proof that you've removed yourself from that position but still receive dividends from a company you know and it's a and it's a it is a structure which is believable and you've got a paperwork trial to prove that that shouldn't be a problem the problem comes and i've spoken to people about it is if they are trying to create a structure you know they're clever in immigration you know we we had um we had a request um for them to prove that somebody had actually signed off a company we had to get screenshots from company's house and stuff so if it's a if it is a true situation where you're receiving dividends you've removed yourself from the company you can prove that someone else is direct to that company whichever way you're going to move to spain you know that's perfectly legitimate of course you can do that creating a structure is a lot different you know you mm -hmm. can't it's very hard to do it's very hard mm -hmm. to yeah like i said on a recent video there are, there are no loopholes really aren't there? they've they're kind of very clever at finding them no, and they're finding their way as well, you know, with, with, with the, the past year, if you look at now what we're on, the 19th of March, well, it's been around a year. I think they opened, the concert opened around this time last year. As we know, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster ride, you know, in terms of what their requirements are, you know, I mean, they started requesting the P45, I think it was in June, July, before that they weren't even bothering, and now they're like, oh, actually, this, we recognise this document now, so, you know, that's what we want to see that you're not, you're not, you're not, um, you're not uh, working, so yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got Barry from Unitech on again. Hello, Barry. Nice to see hey, you. Barry. Uh, he said, would you need to sign anything to the effect that if you have rental income from the UK, you won't sell the property within five years? Interesting question. Great question. Uh, we haven't had any uh, requests for that at the moment. What I'm assuming is that, obviously, if you were to sell the property, then you would have, for your renewal, maybe uh, capital from the property to prove that other than rental income obviously being careful of the capital gains liabilities that you could hold here in spain mm -hmm. yeah we're going to have a show on all about taxation next week so if you have any questions people about taxation then ask them we can ask them under this video or ask them on the facebook group please and then i can collect them and display them on screen for next week and i'll ask our tax expert and also, I just I'm going to put in a plug at this point. If you're going to be exchanging currency for your move, and just about everybody does, or if you're buying a property in Spain and need to exchange currency for that, there is a link in the video description below now to a company called Smart Currency Exchange, which is the company that I used, and they can. And I had a really good time with them, so uh, they give. Uh, uh, hopefully, the best exchange rates, and they're also the number one on Trustpilot for doing that and rather than going through your bank which could cost you about four percent more so i'm happy to recommend them so there you go that's enough plugs done for that so so for passive income obviously you need to you can follow the the monthly eprem figures can't you that's correct yeah and i think we so if you're if you've got passive income and you can prove that you've got the minimum monthly amount then you can follow that. Uh, what's the monthly amount? It's 2000. I've got it on the screen uh, there now. 2,300. Uh, uh, 2000, for a single applicant, 2,316 euros. And for, should we say, a couple, it's 2,895. Um, yes, yeah, so if, you can, if you've got passive income that meets that minimum requirement, that's, 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 that's fine. Yeah, so four, four times that is the 6,948.24. That's the four times EPREM. <clears throat> there we go. 
Yeah, so we quick. always we so we quite focus on the uh, obviously the, the the yearly amount, don't we? Quite a lot, but actually, if you've got passive income, you need to be focusing on the monthly amount, mm. which is the first thing that they, they'll look at in immigration. Yeah, and that's what confuses people when we're doing the, a combination of savings and passive income, which we'll talk about just after savings alone. Uh, if people only have savings, mm-hmm. then it, it strikes me that it's going to be slightly different because they've not got an income coming in. So my question would be, what about visa applicants who are well below retirement age? If they've got no passive income, are they expected to show that af- after these five years worth of savings have run out that they've got in the bank how are they going to survive after that yeah i mean for initially for your initial application with savings you only have to cover the first year obviously but what we say with savings is for the um for the renewals so if you're just working off purely off of savings a lot of people are and again i, I think i saw just a question pop up there there's a lot of people now who are planning to come the second half of the year because they're they're drawing capital from a property sale and again the tax guy will explain why next week but um and they're and they're looking at using that capital to get them through the first five years maybe before their passive income kicks in maybe you know everybody's situation is is quite it is quite different um but obviously for the first year you are only getting you know your first year so you do only have to meet the minimum eprem requirement for the first year for every single or or how many applicants there are coming with you um, on the savings front with the renewals if you're still working from savings obviously what you have to be slightly careful of is that if you're planning on then coming to spain say you know and maybe moving your savings to spain which is always a good idea because on renewals the the immigration authorities want to see that you're, you're integrated you've got a financial base here in spain is that you that you've Obviously, they, if you started with savings and you renewed with savings, they're going to want to know that you've been spending your savings during the year and how you've been living. It's a non lucrative visa. So, uh, you know, if you've got savings in the UK, which you're going to move over to top up uh, for your renewal, then and you've been eating into your savings during the time uh, that you've been living for your first year, you're going to have to have proof of where those savings came from. Mm-hmm. As, you know, any income or any any movements of funds they want to they, they, they could possibly want to know where those funds are coming from hmm. so especially it's a common mis it's a common misconception isn't it that you've just got to have this block of money in the bank and just yes, leave it yeah. there and that's what they're looking for but they're not they they need to know that you're living and yeah and yeah, how you're yeah. Doing. no 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 completely so it's, it's, you can't just you know it's just like well, i'm going to go and stick x amount in the bank i'm going to leave it there and continue but then obviously if that's the case what are you living off of you know, mm-hmm. how do you live? You know, it's not just that you have to take hundred grand, leave it in a bank, and every renewal turn up with a certificate. There's, there's, you know, there's, um, you, you're going to have to offer an explanation of how you live. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, which is fine because if you are living off of passive income or savings in the UK, you've moved more savings over, and there's a paperwork trail of that. That's absolutely fine. We always say that it's better to have assets in Spain rather than. You know in the uk um our experience especially this year and late into last year is that immigration liked to see it was evidently the money in a, in a spanish an account mm-hmm. um, a lot of people who have passive income or investment structures uh, which we can talk about as well mm-hmm. um, we'll be moving those to investment structures which are viable in in spain instead of in the uk mm-hmm um so um again your tax guy probably will talk about that next week but you know there's there is certain ramifications if you have got an investment structure in the uk you come to be a resident in spain you know you may have to change that whole structure but if your investments are in spain and it's a spanish recognized structure then you know then you could maybe use that as your as your financial income uh, your financial stability mm-hmm. for the renewal yeah so let's look at the different examples of, uh, of of a combination. So you've got a combination of savings and passive income. This is the thorny bit that a lot of people don't understand. We had somebody asking that question. Um, was it Steve? Yeah, Steve Knowles said, can't get my head around the amounts you need in the bank progressing every year. And that's because, yeah, if you've got pension and you've got savings. So uh, is there a way of working it out? Yeah, so you need to, there's now, I know uh, there is, there's a common misconception here as well, and there's also 
an interpretation and my opinion on what you need. <laughs> okay. So, um, the first thing is, is if you've got a, if you've got passive income, which meets, should we say, X in a year, then you're going to have to make the rest up with savings. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. for example, if let's say we 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 never advise that you go in with the exact twenty seven thousand seven hundred uh, and. No, oh, I should, know, should really know this off the top of my head. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 27,792.96. Uh, you know, if you're going there, you know, for the 96 cents, you know, it's never a good idea. It's always good to have a little bit more. So we always talk, we always round it off, and it's easier for me to think about 30K, should we say. So mm -hmm. imagine that you're trying to get to achieve 30K and you've got 20K in passive income. Uh, then you get for that first year, you're going to have to make up that other 10K with your savings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the following year, there's, there's, a misconception that and has been around the internet uh, that you only need one year's worth of money to renew for two years now in my opinion and obviously each immigration officer will have its own interpretation of what you have and will review your case in my opinion my opinion the safest way to move forward with that is say for example you have um passive income which meets the minimum monthly uh re minimum monthly requirement then that's fine because that could be considered evidently as only a year's income although it's going to cover you for the two if you have a passive income which doesn't meet the minimum requirement then what you're going to need to do is look at what it does meet so say for example it meets 20k and we're looking for 60 over the space of the two years, then you're going to have to make that up with 20K's worth of savings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does to me, yes. Basically, yeah. you're, you're 20 uh, in, um, in, in pension, for example, if you've got 20K a year in pension, over the two years, you've got 40 already. So there's only Correct. 20 more that you need to cover. Yeah, so you would need to cover that. That's, and now, I, I, in my opinion, that's the best way to move forward and the safest way, you know, or that or more, to to guarantee a renewal. Now there is a, a school of thought that um, that you only need a year, and it's been a lot of rumours circulated around the internet. But you know, you've got to put yourself in the head of an immigration officer who is reviewing your case, and they've got two years, they've got EPREM in front of them, and they're using a the pen to add up what you have. Okay, that's where you've got to be when you're thinking about what you're going to present. You know, not what you can get away with, but how is it easily? Get, how are you easily going to present to the person because it's going to be done digitally as well? You know, who is reviewing your file? What you have? So, as I say, many times when we have done uh, applications which have maybe had slightly complicated um, financial structures, we've literally just written a simple letter. I said A equals B, B equals C, and you get to the bottom, this is what relationship it has with ePrint. And we've never had a problem as long as you explain it. So yeah, that's where you've got to be in your in your sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. If you try if you look like you're trying to get away with it in any way, then that they're going to notice it, aren't they? Yeah, so if you imagine you imagine, so you know, you imagine that you, you haven't got enough for the two years or you haven't made the right combination which doesn't meet minimum in bread, and they knock you back and you go back that well it's okay because I saw on the internet that you only needed one year because that was the opinion of one person and one who had a conversation with an immigration officer and you're in Alicante and they're in a different province, it's just not gonna work, you know, just <laughs> you know, hey, a minute. What do you mean? I said no. Have a look at this video. So you've got to you've got to really really cover all bases and make sure for the renewals you have got the minimum required amount. Evidently, as well though, evidently there's one thing we do have to mention is you don't know what the following year's e prem is going to be. So I think mm -hmm. this is where a lot of misconception comes. So you've got to base it on the information that you have, which is the current rate of e prem. Mm -hmm. Just to answer a quick question from Alan Lackenby. It's all about um, what the timing of the NLV in terms of selling your property in the UK. This is a tax question that we will cover next week. So thank you for that. And we'll answer Barry's question. If you did sell a rental property and monthly income dropped below requirement, can they use that to remove you? <laughs> Do they send the police around and pick you up and say, no, you're not fulfilling requirements anymore? 
Oh, you mean your renewal? No, that'd be picked up on your renewal. That would be, I think, once you've got your renewal, uh, you know, you can, obviously, people's circumstances change. So, you know, once you've got your renewal approved, that's fine, you know, but when you come to renew again, maybe years uh, um, four and five, then, uh, then evidently, if you don't meet the requirements, then you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Good answer. And he also says, following the EU ruling against against Spain, or oh, I don't know about this, what's this? Do, do they still need to declare all assets in other countries now? Modelo 720, that'd be, that'd be a good a good question for your, your tax guy next week. Yeah, it's still in force. Um, that was quite funny, actually, because when that all kicked off regarding the fines, what they've done is they've actually declared the fines illegal. Um, again, your tax guy will be able to tell you better than I can, but uh, there was some, in order about fines for not declaring what you've got abroad and there's a massive it's been going on for years it's more 720 it's still in place you still have to present it if you've got assets abroad of over 50k um but the fines are, uh, are now relevant to to other things within the tax office um and then another thing another question i want to write down is that i saw something about the model 721 which was now declaration of income from cryptocurrency uh, ah. so that might be a, a, a question for the tax guy next week i've made a note of that good uh so oh we've got james back on from uh, otherwise known as nerve can you show a loan or money from parents no no you, it's got to be it's got to be uh it's got to be your money um now again i had this conversation the other day it's down again we go back to the interpretation of the person who's looking at your file if you go to for an NLB and you you just want to go for a year, for example, and have a year out, and suddenly your parents have gone right, there's thirty grand, there's thirty grand, go and have a year out, come back after a year. Who's to say he can't do that? Right, okay, well look at the person who's revising your file. You know, in theory, you can do that. There's nothing to say that you can't take money and have a year out and live in Spain. But you know, that that money it's if they interpret that as do you know what you've just been given that you're going to be working has that money been given legally you know there'd have to be a paperwork trial i don't have to be maybe gift gift tax you know for the money if gift tax been paid on money given to you why can't you use it for a year again you put the best case forward and it'd be down to the interpretation of the person who's looking at it mm. and that answers james's next question what happens if your passive income has been sporadic throughout the last few years um, I don't know why that would be. Is it different uh, interest rates or something like that? But if they, it's occasionally, they would take the annual, your annual, your annual, your annual summary. Um, yeah, that, I mean, if that's, for example, if that's uh, interest on investments, then it's quite tricky, you know, to to prove because that does go like that, doesn't it? So, you know, again, um, you'd have to prove that you meet moving forward the minimum requirements. Mm hmm. I think we answered this question earlier from Beverly. Good morning, Beverly. I've not seen your name in the chat before. Welcome. Uh, she says, I'll be renting out my property when I move. How long before I can use that as passive income? I also have private pension and savings. Again, I mean, if that's, uh, it depends on the private pension and savings. If, for example, your savings and private pension, uh, Beverly, meet the minimum required amount, then the, 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 the property income is by the by. You might be able to use that for your renewal. If that property income is going to be part of the actual application, what I would say, if you're on the phone to me now doing a discovery call, I'd say was get as much documentation in place as you can that that property is legally rented out and and moving forward, the contract's in place, how much you're getting, and at least two or three payments of rent in, in the bank, you know, because you've got to go and show them exactly, you know, what, what income you're getting. So uh, a private contract signed by... Beverly and somebody else with no other official documents probably isn't gonna probably isn't gonna cut the cut the mustard as such. Whereas if you've got a contract or an agency, maybe somebody looking after it for you, a company, you know, a proper contract in place, you've already received a couple of payments, then you know, then they should take that into consideration. Hmm. So it's all about convincing proof, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and also putting it easy, putting it in an easy way. So we always go with a, a structure of um, passive income, then it's obviously savings, a combination of the both, and then it's supporting income and proof that you don't need to work. So, for example, if you've got passive income and savings, we would put first in our file passive income, savings, that would make a combination of the both, and then additional income, which would be rental, 
maybe uh, if you've got some people might have an ISA structure as well, you know, so you could put proof of that ISA structure in there. Uh, some people might have an investment structure which isn't bringing any uh, income at the moment, but it's still wealth, it's still capital, put that in as well. Um, another one is if you own a property in Spain, um, when I spoke to uh, London last year, they said, look, if they own a property in Spain, um, get them to bring a notice simply because that's considered that, you know, as part when they look at how much they're going to be spending, they, if you own a property and it says on the notice simply, you own it outright, but it's considered they're not going to have to pay rent. So, but, you know, when they look at your global situation, they're like, oh yeah, that's a big tick in the box. London told me that we do that for all our clients, whether get them out or get a notice simply for them, or if if they've got one themselves, that's fine. And then about a month later, we had a client who went to Manchester. We got them a notice simply. Manchester went, oh, we don't need to see that. <laughs> but I don't care. You know, it's, it is it is what it is. We keep putting it in there, and if they say they don't want to see it, you're better off coming away with lots of uh, scrap paper than than uh, than missing something. Mm-hmm. We've had two questions which are interesting. One from Mr. Mitchell, eh? he's asked about for an EU passport type residency, uh, but I'll just put up the other one, Jane Jane Perks. Hello, welcome back, Jane. Uh, not sure if this is relevant today, but here goes anyway. Are there minimum savings or income requirements if you're a couple where one of you is an EU citizen and the other one isn't? Yeah, that relates. It relates back to EPREM as well. And you have to be a bit careful in the areas where you're where you're where you're applying from. Here, the minimum, you know, you want to say. It's actually quite low, so you know it's, it's 100% minimum for an EU uh, system. This is probably a whole show on this. Mm. Um, and then, if depends if that person is a beneficiary on that per, uh, on the other person, then uh, or is applying just over their own income um, to how much you need. But we always say that the best way is if you both can meet minimum of 100% uh, EPREM, then that's then that's fine. And we've done them like that um, with. Um, just a comment on this, and it came up today with e, with the EU and um, non EU, so uh, very similar to the operation you've done, Scats. You know, where you came, <laughs> yours first, and we've got Liz's. Um, it's always best if you have your assets in Spain. You know, we had we a couple of years ago. They've been going where you can prove you're allowed to have assets wherever you like, and the proof that you give to immigration um, um, has to be translated if if your assets aren't here. But um, it's become a lot more difficult for people who have everything abroad. And you say it's better if you are coming as an EU citizen and you get yourself set up properly, bring your savings into account in bank account in Spain. If you're working, obviously autonomy, if you've got a contract, and then when your family member comes to register, um, they seem to make it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Jane says, do that show for me then. <laughs> we will. Actually, there is a video that we did um, not that long ago actually uh, late last year where we talked about different scenarios for whether we had we had one eu and one non-eu and where one of them was working and then whether the other one was working so yeah have a look um in our video back catalog there i think it was either just before i moved in october or just afterwards something like that so we could, yeah. i'll tell you what we could do there's a there's actually a, a structure for a video there because you've got you had a video thinking out loud now eu eu and eu family member you've got eu family member working eu family member self-employed eu family member savings three examples you know there's probably an hour's worth of uh, me and you waffling on there okay we'll put that in the list then there we go and uh, oh here we go interesting David Wright says you do not need double income in years two and three. This has changed now. This video is misleading. Tell him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that. Uh, yeah, I understand. There's a video out there which says you don't. Um, and I think all I'd say, David, is down to the interpretation of the person who's going to be presenting that on either your behalf or someone else's, and how they secure that their client um, gets their renewal. So. So, yeah, uh, the interpretation of one person and one um, immigration uh, officer does not represent the whole of Spain. There we go. And we have, oh, yeah, Steve back again. If you cannot meet the EPREM amounts on, say, years two and three, would they throw you out even if you owned uh, 150K Villa outright? 
I don't think anybody's coming to throw you out, but you wouldn't get your renewal, so you'd be legally obliged to leave if you didn't have enough money. Yeah. yeah. So actually having a, a piece of capital there uh, as a as a villa doesn't count to the amount, does it? No, unfortunately it doesn't. Now, in EU residences, um, uh, funnily enough, here in Malaga, if you're going for an EU residency, you own a property, you only have to take a note to simply improve that with no income, and they'll give you residency off the back of that. Um, other areas of Spain won't do that, so, you know, it depends um, really where you are, but unfortunately for visas, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were talking earlier about uh, how immigration interprets the different financial products in the UK. Have we said enough about that? or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, what we can just touch on, like, our experience really this year, because um, we've had, uh, we have had investment structures uh, accepted. <laughs> um, we've had an investment structure where we've got some paperwork translated and they turned around and said, no, we want to see, um, see liquidable assets, like money in the bank. So we had to liquidate some of the money, put it in a bank and go, well, there you go. That's, that's where it's come from. That's how much they got. That's the cash. It went okay. Uh, there's various ISA structures which we've used for people and um, which aren't, so we say, generating interest, which meets minimum, minimum e-prem, but it is there and you can prove that the, 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 it's accessible, even though it's a, it was an investment ISA structure, the money was accessible. Um, so that was, that was approved. That was one recently, actually. And actually, that one relates back to the letter that I was going to show. This is a letter from uh, the consulate, which... Um, they accepted the income, which was an investment-based ISA structure, um, but they needed further proof that the person wasn't working. So we wrote a letter which basically showed a timeline of when they gave up their company, they were employed by their company, so the idea they were directed, they were employed, so we managed to get P45, they accepted that, so that was good. Um, Premium bonds. We've had premium bonds accepted. Now, this is something that um, was a bit iffy, should we say, at first. They were really, right at the beginning of last year, and even to the middle of last year, they were like, no, no, we want to see that cash in the bank. So people have had to cash in their premium bonds, put them in the bank, and then they've been accepted. We had a couple like that through Edinburgh. But then we've had some premium bond statements, actually just this week in, in, in Edinburgh, translated, and they were accepted. Uh, so, you know, wow, that's changed as well. Um, we recently had a client who moved some premium bonds about and the movement was over 10K. So if you've got any sort, in the last 12 months of your financial proof, should we say, if you're going in with bank account statements, stuff like that, if there's any big movements of money, they may ask you uh, what is the origins of that. Again, you would just have to prove where it's come from, where it's going to, you know whichever way you can so um, mm -hmm. yeah i think that's covered that yeah brilliant uh question oh oh yeah that's not the question i was going to put up but yes that would be a good chair to do um if the passive income is from a business how do you show you've not been working in it and we kind of slightly covered that earlier but uh carry on it's tough it's tough you know you can't if your passive income is from a business then they could, cause you're still a director of that business or whatever. Then it's, then it's, then that's a, that's a call by immigration. If you're, if you can imagine, they look at it. If you've got a, a business which is, you know, maybe if you viably running itself and you viably stepped away and just taking dividends because, you know, you you're you're right, you're right, you know, you're retiring. Then then and you can prove that, then that's fine. But you know, is there a set document that proves that? No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, you know, you'd have to prove that there's a new director in the business. You know, sort of form. It's a tiff, it's a it's a very tough one. If you're over uh, state pension age, then it's easier to prove because you're a pensionable age. If you're stepping away from a business, say at fifty, then it's extremely hmm. difficult to prove. Yeah. And Barry says, ooh, premium bonds. My mum and dad bought me £10 worth when I was born. Never won a penny in 58 years. <laughs> oh, dear. Can, can, well, you, can you buy premium bonds if, you're, if you live abroad? That's a question for you. So. Mm, I bet that £10 is worth a lot more now, though, surely. Or does, do you have to win in order for it to be worth more? I don't know. My mum used to work at the office in Durham, so I should know the answer to that one. <laughs> there you go. Um, oh, it, uh, you mentioned uh, to me a couple of days ago 
what exceptional circumstances and strange requests you've had from immigration recently. You said there'd been quite a few. Tell us about those. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's mainly about like people uh, who, who, so we had, uh, I say, our guy there who we had to give his, um, the, the structure, when, when he, um, his pension didn't meet the minimum requirement, then I actually went, I googled xe.com, <laughs> I just went, you know, quickly, wrote a quick letter, sent it off, and that was, and that was, uh, that was accepted. Um, this, this case, with they asked for, further proof that the person wasn't working. Obviously, we couldn't get anything from from company's house because they wound down their company, but it's all on screenshots. So was, and, you know, you can imagine with immigration, you know, you're trying to present everything as stamped. They love a stamp. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, how are we going to do this? So I was like, well, you know, well, let's just screenshot everything. Screenshot it, created a PDF, and I accepted it. You know, so, so that was fine. Um, and then other things uh, um, that we've come across... Or as one thing I did, it's a completely different show, but the S ones are now absolutely rocking and rolling. We've had our first ones uh, registered here in Spain now, mm-hmm. so people have got the S one. They've gone to Almeria and they've registered the S one using their new TIE card in Spain. Fantastic news! Just to uh, add that in there, what's in my mind? Um, yeah. So, and we we do sometimes with they do request um to see you have to put things plainly yeah so if you've got my advice would be to people that if you are preparing say to come next year because obviously people are going to be looking at these shows who are coming not only now but in a in a few years is to maybe if you have got a really complicated structure to your financials but do meet the minimum requirement try and simplify it as best possible to be able to present it to immigration mm-hmm Good. Any other strange requests? Uh, no, off the top of my head, no. I did have it written down, but I can't I'll probably remember in a minute what it was now. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, Alan Lackenby, this is, this is a good question. Will my wedding certificate from Vegas be accepted for my application? <laughs> it, as long as it's got an app or still and translated, yes, it will. And um, there's a service that actually does that quite quickly as well. I've got a website for that. Um, yeah. So so, they do, was that Apostille Services, the one that... Because yeah, they, yeah, the show. yeah, they can, they can, yeah, they, yeah, of course, yeah, you had Zach on last week, yeah, so you, you, it's worth speaking to them, um, and yeah, it will be, yeah, the wedding certificate from Vegas is fine, uh, wedding certificate from anywhere is fine, as long as it's legalised properly and translated. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's, that's what I meant, the strange request, there's another one there, just popped into my head, um, we had a request from, there was one person who was heavily dependent on the other and although they were married they requested a notarized translated document that the person who provided the financial stability would take charge of the other person uh, in the, for the period of the visa so that's mm. quickly run to a notary in the uk get that document written up get it apostilled quickly thank you zach very quick and um and send it to the we had 10 days to do it send it in and then their visas were approved straight away so that's the first time we'd seen that so you know it's um yeah it's, things like that come up brilliant let's see we have a premium bonds reply apparently you can buy premium bonds from outside the uk if it complies with local regs uh, but uh, in the uk in the us premium bonds are classified as gambling oh didn't know that I, I was wondering, it just put a question popped into my head. I wonder if I wanted to buy my kids premium bonds, I don't know how to do it. They're obviously Spanish residents born here. Mm. Um, I'm a Spanish permanent resident. I have nothing in the UK because I left 23 years ago. So I just wondered mm. if I could do that or not. Well, I'll have a look into it. There you go. And Beverly says, my partner is Irish. Yeah, oh, yeah brilliant. Can I piggyback on him instead of me getting a non-lucrative visa? Uh, partner is in wife, spouse, registered partner. Evidently, yes, you can. Uh, partner is in been living together six months is a lot harder to do, if, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Steve has another question. If people come over with kids on the non-lucrative re- uh, visa, eventually the kids will need a job. So after the five year period, do they need to apply for a work visa? Ooh. They'll get permanent residency after five years. So the family will have permanent residency. So the kids eventually, when they grow older, should be able to work on the permanent residence basis. Mm-hmm. 
It's a lovely little conversation going on on the on the live chat. I'm going to share it anyway. You can all see it down the side of the screen. Um, the Barry's asking Alan, did Elvis conduct the wedding ceremony? Alan said, unfortunately, he's dead. Alan says that nonsense. He sings in Bobby's Bar near Puerto Poyenta. See him every year. <laughs> nice. I like these little chats. Um, let's have some shout outs, Chris. Have you got any? Uh, I have. Successful yeah, people? Second, yeah, let me have some shout outs here. Let me just open our. Our calendar thing. You can see I'm well prepared this morning, aren't I? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes. So I, I wanted to give a shout. Just a couple of shout outs. One to David. He's looking to move to Lanzarote. I know he's going to be watching today. I spoke to him last week. And another one to Amanda and Paul from Scotland, who I spoke to uh, last week as well. We were planning for the future to come over. Uh, and evidently, you know, all our regular viewers. And Shamil, who's got his appointment, I know he's going to be watching this week and uh yeah that's me for shout outs i think this week mm -hmm. what about prizes let's give out a prize who's not had right. one yet Check well, these got... you're gonna yeah. like these prizes now Ooh, for lovely. people in spain i can't send these to the uk because um the youth, because of customs and stuff but getting ready for summer oh, oh i've got one of them oh. and you've got, got your logo on it brilliant We've got two of these to give away for cars in Spain. So let's mm -hmm. have a couple of Spain prizes. Yeah. If you're on the chat and you live in Spain, give us a shout. And uh, we'll give them out. So we've got, I've got a couple of these here. And then for the UK, obviously the people we sent out to last week, let us know, especially John from New Zealand, if your packet arrived, because I'm like, I had to sign million bits of paper to sign out. With. <laughs> yeah, Anthony... Anthony did say uh, uh, somewhere on the chat. Thanks for the, thanks for the prize. Oh, great! I'm glad he got it. That's 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 good. So, and then for people in the UK, we have passport holders. Yay! So uh, I can send those as a document. You see, if we put them like that in an envelope, mm -hmm. go through as documents and jump through customs. Whereas I can't get away with sending that as a document. Brilliant. Who should we pick them? What about Beverly? We haven't sent Beverly a, a prize. Yeah, listen, um, Beverly, where are you, Beverly? Tell us where you where you are and we'll work out which prize is down to you. Yeah, send Chris your details via his website or get in touch with us on the Facebook group, the YouTube Spain Facebook group. Um, either way, get us your details, do a private message. And uh, anybody Let's else? Let us know if it's just you or you and a, and a hubby or you and a partner, uh, Beverly, because if it's two of you, I'll send you each out. Uh, yeah. Yay. Anybody else on there that's uh, uh, answered the question well or had a good comment for us? Did, have we see. sent Alan one yet? Have we sent Alan anything yet? Because uh, Alan Lackenby? Yeah. I don't think so. Alan, have you had a prize yet? Just get in touch. You're still, you're definitely still around uh, on the chat there because you asked us a question only, only a few minutes ago. Now, Beverly's in London, so Beverly's going to get... We've got Mike here. Mike answered my premium bonds question as well. Oh, yeah. Let's send one to Mike. Yeah. There we go. And if anybody can uh, give us a good comment on the Facebook group, then we'll send a prize out on there, especially if you're, if you're from in Spain. Anybody from Spain watching, get in touch. <laughs> you might get a prize. You might get one of those uh, uh, heat things. What do yeah. they call them? Uh, I don't know. Protects your car, doesn't Deflect it, from the sunshine? Yeah, yeah, Deflector. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, John. John said not arrived. <laughs> not arrived in New Zealand yet. That's not a surprise, really. There we go. Yeah. So, I, I got that. Actually, I got this t shirt. This is. It's, from American company, you know, I've got loads of different U2 designs. This one's the U Scrudely 2. I thought I'd make some really stupid ones instead of my normal uh, U2 Spain t shirt. So we've got loads of those, but it comes from Teespring, which they're based in America, but they posted out from Germany and I, I had to buy it at cost. But um, it came through and I had to pay for customs charges for it, uh, even though it only came from Germany. It had a Germany sticker on the box and everything. So I think, I think I did I tell you about the customs, the letter that I got from customs, which was declared wrong and came to the office and they took it back off of me because I didn't have the two cents. No. I'll tell you a quick story silly. about that. I had a really funny one where we had a letter come to the office, came from the UK, 
Apparently it was declared incorrectly. It said toy on it, but it was paperwork, which you can quite evidently see as paperwork. You know, it was mm -hmm. weighed less than a piece of paper. And the Correos guy bought it here. Very nice guy. Comes every day. He said, Chris, you've got to pay 10 euros and five cents for this from customs, but it's got to be cash. And I went, okay, don't worry. So, and I went, I didn't have 10 euros and five cents. I only had like a 20 euro note. Or I just didn't have it in change. So I quickly, frantically ran around knocking on offices and couldn't find the 10 euros and five cents. So, and I had it in my hand. I had it there. I, went, I can't give it to you then. I went, I've got 10 euros and I've got 11 euros. Just, you know, keep the change. And it was like, no, no, no. You can't, you can't do that. It's got to be. So he said, I'm going to have to take it back and then it'll be rerouted to your local um, post office. And I was like, I could be able to find five cents. Anyway, I couldn't get it at the time. And I was on a call as well. So I said, okay, whatever you need to do. So he gave me a piece of paper. So it was then rerouted back to Malaga. <laughs> that <laughs> rerouted it back to Alarin. And then in Alarin, when it got to our PO box, they sent me a message two weeks later to say that you've got to come pick it up. Oh no! So, I had it. I had it there. What a palaver! Yeah. Well, that's the end of the questions. Unless anyone has got anything more on the chat, in a minute I'll be. Uh, we'll say goodbye to Chris, and I'll tell you all about next week's show, which I mentioned earlier. So, any more final questions? We've got a twenty-second delay, so I've got to yatter on just for a few seconds. Oh, um, nice. They're having a conversation about uh, two of them are from New Zealand. There we go. They're they're talking about which parts of New Zealand they are living in. So John and Beverly. I think and... I think just to um just to summarise with the with the non lute visa and, and, and the uh and the and the financials, obviously it is a it's a it's a, a fight so it's a initially obviously you've got your tax guy coming on next week, they'll be able to tell you the best time to come. We've got we've got quite a busy time in April because a lot of people are waiting for the, uh, the correct tax year to move, which means starting in April uh, for some people. Um, obviously, coming later than July, which the tax guy is going to explain. And then, obviously, you've got the five-year period. You know, look at, unless you have, a lot of people only have a plan for a year, um, you know, and that's great to have a year out, you know. But um, if you are looking to retire, um, look at the look at the five-year period and how it's going to be structured and how you can keep that structure simple and then legal within Spain. That's really, you know, the only advice I can do. Great. I missed the question out early. Thank you, Mad Dave. Mad David, for reminding me, I've just found it. He says, morning chaps, is it possible to come on a non-lucrative visa and after a year or two change if you want to work or set up a business? Um, yeah, if you do it, if you do it correctly, though, we know that they're, they're extremely uh, difficult work, work. Well, no, so if you if you're coming on a work, if you come over on lucrative visa, find work, and then you want to you want to exchange that for a work visa, then the person who's going to employ you will have to apply for the right to do so. And that you'll do that within Spain uh, instead of doing it from the UK. And the same for if you do set up a business, though we know that it's quite difficult to get a uh, self-employed visa. But yeah, you know, once your mm. residency right runs out, you can you can gain the right whichever way you like. You know, but yeah, so mm -hmm. it's so the danger is that if you think, oh, I've, I've got this job and it's, they're just trying to sort out the details of it and you're coming up to your renewal of your non-lucrative visa that you that you say to yourself, well, I won't even bother reapplying for my non-lucrative visa and then it falls through, then you're going to be um, up the creek. Really. Time, is, time is key, yeah, time is key. Yeah. There we go. Thank you for reminding me about that question, David. And that is the last question. So... Yeah. We've gone beyond the hour. Well, it's been a very good show. Thanks very much for your, uh, your input again, Chris. It's been brilliant. Excellent. OK, thanks for having me on again. You're welcome. We'll see you in two weeks. I don't know see what we'll time. be talking about, but I'm sure it'll be something great. Yeah. Brilliant. Cheers. So, everybody wave bye-bye. Bye. Bye for now. OK, then. So, let's tell you about next week's show i did mention earlier it's going to be about tax we have had lots and lots and lots of requests for this topic i even put a poll on the facebook group to say what do you want to know about and tax came up big so i will be talking to a tax specialist it's a senior partner from blevins franks all about spanish tax there uh, blevins franks have um, offices in spain they have offices in the uk and they deal with tax from you know worldwide 
So we'll be talking about Spanish tax and how your earnings or savings or profits or investments from outside of Spain are taxed here. So ask us questions in advance on the Facebook group, please. And join us next week at the regular time of nine o'clock if you're in the UK or Ireland, 10 o'clock if you're in Spain or four o'clock in the morning if you're for, if you're in New York. You lucky thing. Don't forget to check out YouTube Yoga's YouTube YouTube channel. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? You can get free yoga and meditation classes. And of course, the, the, the T-shirts. We've got a merchandise page, uh, lots of other goodies and hoodies and all that kind of thing. And don't forget to buy me a coffee or even become a patron on the Patreon site to support YouTube Spain. All of the links to all of those things can be found in the video description below. Just there's a show more thing down by the, where it says information about the video, not far below the screen there. So that's all for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Do please subscribe and click on the bell if you hadn't already. And just to say peace and love. And don't forget to dance, dance to the music. Get out your castanets. Here we go. Bye for now.